welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and uh, truly, obviously excited today. Um, we have a guest that was here on, on with us a couple of years ago and uh, changed my thinking, it, literally, uh, um, the way I think about children and everything else like that. It really, really did. A, a researcher, a top researcher, uh, she's a psychiatrist, uh, Tulane University, um, I don't know, but Dr. Stacy Jury. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me back. Well, I'm excited it, to be here. Well, we're definitely we're, we're excited to have you. Uh, first, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about you know your work. Just a quick blob about what you're doing at Tulane. Um, so at Tulane, I work with uh, an amazing group of people, um, and we have recently formed sort of a, a cross-disciplinary research cluster, really focused on understanding the impact of adversity, trauma, violence. Um, environmental exposures and how these influence child health and development and also influence health disparities. So my piece of it is very much interlaced and interwoven with this transdisciplinary group um, and I focus on genetic and epigenetic interactions with early adversity and how that influences child's social, emotional, behavioral and health outcomes. Uh, and we focus a lot on some sort of molecular markers of exposure, but really also look at health outcomes. So how these early adverse life experiences influence risk for cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, and really understanding that all of those health outcomes are very much associated with these early adverse life events that kids are experiencing. Okay. Um I mean, absolutely awesome. Let's do an umbrella out uh, because what prompted the call? Because you know, usually we call them in advance, but this time it's like an emergency. Doctor Drury, you know, I call. It's need, we need to speak. Um, the killing of children in New Orleans uh, to me is a story that should last for centuries. To see the killing in neighborhoods, you know, of young people, that's different. But when we have this cluster of little five-year-olds, three-year-olds, seven-year-olds being shot. Um, to the point where it's, it, it, it's almost becoming commonplace in mid-city, lower Ninth Ward, um, and I think those are the main areas, Gentilly, those areas uh, where these people in these inner city New Orleans, uh, it's almost commonplace. Let's drop that in and, and shut um, I think that it is tremendously important and it will have my feeling is that it will have very long-term outcomes as well. Uh, we just completed a study funded by the National Institute of Health and we sort of asked kids in the community, so they were not kids recruited from any specific community, but really every census tract that we could find. And we asked their parents um, how many of them had witnessed a murder, how many of them had witnessed a family member hurt or killed, um, and the rates of exposure in our communities were extremely high. So 25% of our kids, and these were not kids that were coming in for psychiatric care or had behavioral disruptions, these were community recruited children. So 25% of them had witnessed a murder. 30% um, of them had seen a family member hurt or injured or thought that they were gonna have a family member hurt or killed or themselves. So strikingly high rates of exposure to really high level of violence and it's not limited to a particular neighborhood and the impact is not limited to a particular demographic. These exposures happen and it's kids that other kids are in school with, it's siblings, it's cousins. Um, New Orleans is a very family community based society so um, a couple months ago there was a, um, a shooting and there was a 10 year old kid, this was his second or third time that he'd been shot and he'd had two relatives, um, one of whom was a five year old who had also been shot. And that's the kind of high level exposure that we are talking about. And I think that there is evidence in the adult literature that these exposures don't just influence um, you know, psychiatric illnesses or mental health, but they actually are very strongly correlated with medical outcomes. So again, this is where the link between these early experiences and in adults, there's very good evidence that 
these exposures lead to higher rates of obesity, smoking, cancer, cardiovascular disease. And what our research has focused on is really seeing if we can detect those changes because of these events earlier. Um, and what we are seeing is that these events are actually influencing the biology of children um, as, and we've looked as early as four years of age and most recently have been funded to look at prenatal exposure and in the first year of life. So these events have lasting biological influences. We have solid evidence in the adult population that it influences or at least is associated with negative health outcomes and that we have a highly traumatized and exposed community currently. Um, and I think those are really important things to put out there that it's not just mental health, um, that it has the potential to be influencing how kids respond to stressors, how they respond to um, violence overall and how their bodies respond versus how they emotionally respond may not be the same and so their bodies may be more reactive but their external appearance or their external response may not reflect that. Um, there have been studies of um, for families that have had a parent commit suicide or incarceration, the same types of things are happening which is that this leads to increased risk of poor overall outcomes, so they don't do as well academically. They have more trouble um, with mental health problems. And it really permeates every aspect of both biology and outcomes. And we are really working at the level of looking at how early we can track this and what associations are strongest. So community violence carries with it multiple aspects. It's not just seeing someone shot, it's these other components of it, what it does to the family system, what it does to the community, what it may be doing to how often a kid goes for a walk in that neighborhood. And to really use a multiple level approach to understanding that, so we go and we'll walk through the neighborhoods and we'll take a look at the sort of level of disorder of a neighborhood and to try to gather information about how safe people feel in their neighborhoods. And all of those factors are interwoven. So when we talk about the impact at the level of biology of witnessing a murder or losing a family member to um, a violent crime, we can say that that's a marker of it, but it has a multiple level impact on lots of things and other associated factors that contribute. And I think one of our goals is to really demonstrate the biological impact identify what factors um, at each level, so at the community level, at the household level, and the individual level, are changeable. Um, and also to figure out how best to create protection or buffer for our children. Um, and one thing that we know that can be protective, and we actually are seeing this in our data, is um, that parent-child relationship and we and I talked about that before, really strengthening our families and having supportive, responsive parenting can be a buffer to the impact of these stressful life events that kids are experiencing. Um, I think from my perspective, one of the things that we hope is really to engage our community and say, these are the rates, this is what we're seeing. Some of the kids that are exposed to this will develop psychiatric illnesses like post-traumatic stress disorder. And from my perspective, that's a very easy treatable disorder. We have cognitive behavioral therapy, it's effective. Um, so 30% of kids approximately who are exposed to a murder will develop post-traumatic stress disorder, but we have a treatment for it. And making sure that parents recognize that these are the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, that they recognize there is evidence-based treatment for it, that it's not medicine, it's therapy. Um, and that we know that if you don't treat post-traumatic stress disorder, it doesn't go away on its own. So we have data from um, Dr. Mike Skeringa that shows that kids in our community, and this is again research done in New Orleans, who developed PTSD, after two years still had it. So it doesn't go away. And so making sure from that standpoint we treat them. But also when kids experience these events, um, you know, helping families cope with that process, helping people understand the impact of it, and that just because a child doesn't look distressed doesn't mean that it doesn't have an impact. Um, and going after, again, sort of where we can intervene and where we can provide support. 
and our hope is to really engage um, the community as we go forward and do our research um, to find out what they think is most helpful to really engage where they see um, an intervention may be most effective. So we can come up with data and say these are the things that are influencing it, but what in your community or what in your household do you think we could help to influence to help protect your children? Because everybody wants their children to grow up and to do well and to achieve and to be healthy. So really having a partnership as we do this research. It's not that we want to do it in a vacuum. It doesn't work that way. We have to be engaged with the community and hear from the community what they're hoping to change. Uh, I think that that's an important component of what we're doing now. And from my standpoint, I think there's sort of three big things to pay attention to. One is that the rates are ridiculously high and that the cumulative exposure has been shown to have a much stronger influence than single exposures and that these are both mental health and medical illnesses that are associated with it. Um, that there is treatments and interventions that exist and that we need to be open to talking about the impact on, on kids and what they're thinking and feeling um, and to really go after it that way. Um, amazing when we look at, I guess, the holistic nature of uh, these events that uh, Obviously, people don't know the impact of what they're doing. That I think that's obvious. No, no human being could recognize that their trauma that they're doing to children can have such, you know, huge effects. I, I wouldn't believe that. Uh, so, if we, in a way, the, those things that are traumatizing, is there any idea of the uh, if we can list? the most traumatizing events, obviously seeing a child murdered. I know it's kind of gory, but what are the worst things? So, that you know, there hasn't been studies that have really tried to characterize what is the most predictive. Okay. Um, certainly the evidence is strongest for physical maltreatment of children. Um, and certainly direct exposure, so, you know, being shot or having a family member killed. Um, and, you know, sort of the evidence about proximity to the event isn't as powerful, so it's not necessarily that you had to be standing right there. Um, some of the work that, uh, again, Dr. Skaringa did with the post-Katrina children um, was that many of their strongest post-traumatic stress symptoms were actually not from when the hurricane hit, but when they came back and saw their house destroyed. Um, so certainly the, what we think and what we're seeing in our data is that disruptions to the family, so death within a family or um, you know, incarceration of a parent, um, or an illness, a medical illness within your family unit has potentially a greater effect than community level. But it's really most often the cumulative number of exposures. So when we ask about life events, we ask about um, natural disasters, because we live in New Orleans and we always ask about natural disasters. We ask about community violence, so witnessing non-family members versus family members. We ask about domestic violence and maltreatment. Um, and, but we also ask about food security, so how able are you to get food and how comfortable are you that what you have in terms of resources are there. Uh, we also ask about how safe you feel in your neighborhood and how much you believe your um, neighborhood individuals will support or help you. And um, my hope is that we will see that this sense of social support from your neighborhood or community is another source of buffering. Um, you know, car accidents in kids are just as likely to predict post-traumatic stress disorder as violence. Um, if I could just say that you had one car accident and one exposure to violence, they would equally be predictive, at least, of post-traumatic stress disorder in children. Unfortunately, the violence that we're experiencing is not just one event. So if you ask me what is most predictive, I would tell you in a very long-winded way that I think it's cumulative exposure. It's how many hits and how many different hits that are the most predictive of negative outcomes. I guess it begs the question of, uh, so a culture, a social network of violence, when a neighborhood is, or the family is full of violence, um, it, it's not, I wouldn't think, it's not just the violent act itself, it's just the culture of violence, the, the 
language of violence, the threat of violence, just the, the way people relate to one another. Um, I think if you want to, like from a community perspective, I would say that um, potentially the community can be a source of negative exposure or stress exposure, but I, I tend to be a little bit more optimistic in that I think that a community can also be a source of buffering or protection. So certainly if your community has a tremendous amount of gun violence or murders, um, that can't be good. But if your community has a, is a supportive environment for you and you feel safe and you feel as if you could trust your neighbors, ideally that could serve as a buffer for this other sort of events that are happening around you. And that's what we really want to know is what, where can those buffers be built? Um, ideally, we will stop the violence, which is always important. Um, I think our research really wants to identify what are most predictive and then where we can build protection and buffers. So if bringing a community together and really helping them you know, talk through these events and connect against them and uh, create a safer perception within your own home or within your own community, if that could buffer the biological effects, that would be great while we try to figure out the root cause of the actual violence itself. Um, and so I think part of it is my hope from this research is that the understanding that these experiences are likely leaving kind of a biological trace in our children, that the cumulative exposure is worse than single events, and that as these children grow and move forward, our job is really to help them recover from that biological impact and create a buffering, nurturing environment where they can do well and thrive. And that's sort of the focus of the research. And really the goals, I guess, from both a public health policy standpoint, um, an individual intervention standpoint, and um, really focusing at the community level as well. I mean, it's awesome. It's going to take the entire community to create a Marshall Plan or whatever to do it. Now, does it seems as though when you're speaking about the biological effects that we're creating a that's it's a cycle because once kids have the biological effects and mental effects, then it they impose it upon, and then we have this cycle. That am I correct? Does it seem? Does it? Um, I don't know. And I okay. think that that is an important area of research. So one of the things that we are focusing on is that transgenerational transmission. Um, and I think that that is a question. I think in terms of passing it on, you know, I don't, I don't think there's evidence to say that. I think okay. if the community and the exposures stay high um, and parents who have been exposed to um, violence or adverse life events who have developed post-traumatic stress disorder or depression um, or other stress-related disorders, it can impact their parenting and that can lead to less potentially sensitive parenting and that may make it harder for parents to buffer kids who are exposed to similar traumas um, and that's a hypothetical model. I think there's data um, that is out there, but I think there's more data needed to really demonstrate that, to build um, a model about that. I think that the biological hits are important, but kids and even adults um, are very plastic or resist resilient and that given the appropriate change in the environment or appropriate support, we may be able to correct the biological hits. Um, and I, that's, I, again, I'm optimistic. I think that there are lasting impacts and those are what we're detecting now. I think if we can intervene, um, increase awareness, uh, begin to figure out what prevention efforts are needed to not just keep kids from being exposed to that, which would be great, but if they are exposed to it, to help figure out what is most important to protect them psychologically, behaviorally, cognitively, and biologically as well. well I'll never forget, um, because we, we had the video from the last show, uh, and we focused plenty on telomeres in the Romanian kids' study. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just loaded it up to YouTube, I think it was about six months ago, uh, to make sure people were able to see it. And I never get on a title, I put, um, I was trying to figure what would make people understand, and, and I put the effects of love starved children. You know? And I don't know if that was right, I said I always wanted to ask and see if that was a good way. <laughs> but, because to me, the culmination of all that you said then and all that I hear you saying now, if kids were just loved and they were safe 
in a safe environment, that becomes a buffer. Is that a good synopsis? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think we have evidence that this, this parent-child relationship is our strongest source of buffering for children. Um, you know, I would love to, again, end community violence, um, but I think that focusing on the parent-child relationship is an area, um, there is evidence that if you improve the parent-child relationship, you can influence how a child's stress response system works. Um, we're working with some people now who have suggested that if you improve the parent-child relationship, you actually can protect telomeres. Um, and I think that that would be great data to see and to share, which is um, that kids live within a family context. Um, oftentimes in the mental health world, we're stuck just treating children. But if we don't get appropriate support for parents, we don't get the resources that the parents need, we're fighting a battle with an arm behind our back. We cannot effectively provide support for children without making sure that their parents are okay um, and creating that context where everybody feels safer. Uh, I worry sometimes that there are a lot of parents out there that didn't grow up with that. Um, that have had these adverse early experiences and really helping them parent their children in a way that maybe they didn't have because they have the potential to buffer or create more support for their kids than maybe they got. Um, so unless somebody, uh, you know, we can put money into schools, but unless we put money into parents. Parents are incredibly important. Um, parents, also in terms of schools, we need to have parents engaged in schools. So, you know, there's a tremendous amount of, um, over the years, we've had a lot of shootings that have happened at schools or, you know, where the buses were picking up kids. Um, and so schools are where our kids are most of the time. So, you know, somewhere between six and 12 hours a day. But to separate interventions from school-based or parent-based without having that connection between them isn't nearly as powerful. Um, really getting the parents engaged in the interventions that we put in schools is just as important so that the information doesn't and the intervention doesn't just stop when the kid walks home, that there's a coherence to what we're doing to support our children. All right. Um, this may not be where the research is, but I'm going to throw it out. Okay. okay. All right. Um, an attitude of, you're not going to mess with me. I'll, I'll, I'll take you out, that I'm not going to let them embarrass me. I'm not going to allow that to happen. You, this won't happen. I'm going to get you. Um, that type of talk and culture, to me, creates the entire violent scenario. It's not about drugs. Everybody knows that drugs are just a small part of it. This, this family fighting with that family. Or this one, you know, you embarrass me. You, you, it's like... Uh, I, the, is the research, is, it, is anything in there address that type of, um, and, and, and I don't use the term ignorance, I, I'll, I'll use the term of fear, because I think the deeper emotion is fear of losing oneself in the midst of not knowing who they are. Uh, I don't know if I'm throwing that out. So, um, very tricky. Um, so I'm going to retreat and go with what is in the evidence and in the studies. Go ahead, but we're good. Um, we're good. Because I have a personal thought about it, and but there's there's data that really talks about um, exposure to and, and almost all the data comes from physical maltreated kids. Okay. So kids who've been exposed to physical maltreatment do several things. One is they respond to threat differently, so they identify um, anger with less cue, so they will misinterpret. Um, someone as being threatening when they're just kind of a little bit frustrated or sad. They over-interpret and over-identify anger. They tend to have something called attention bias, and that means that they look for anger or they look for threat more, but it also means that they cannot disengage from threat. So that oftentimes I think is what, um, particularly with traumatized adolescents, is a, is a challenge, which is if they're threatened, their immediate response is to pay attention to the threat, but they can't back away because the ability to disengage from threat has been influenced by those early experiences. So they, so kids who have been exposed to violence, um, specifically maltreatment in the literature, but potentially other types of violence, will identify anger and threat faster. They respond to it 
they will get more aroused. So their fight or flight response kicks in. Once that happens, it's really hard to make good choices. And all of those things are heightened in adolescence. So the adolescent brain is not the smartest brain in the book. It's driven almost entirely by the back part of the brain, the amygdala, which is your emotion center. It's not just a fear center, it's every emotion. So that's why when you're 16 and you get your license and you want to drive your car 100 miles an hour, it seems like a really good idea because you're super excited. And the concept of something bad happening when you're driving your car 100 miles an hour is supposed to come from the front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. And adolescent brains don't have a really good prefrontal cortex. So they're driven high energy emotions pushing forward and the really think through process part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, isn't as strong, so it's overrun a lot. So if you take an adolescent who has had exposures to maltreatment or abuse, they will have a larger threat response and they don't have the sort of prefrontal cortex or executive function part of the brain to say, oh wait, if I go after that person, my chances of getting hurt are worse. So I think you're assessment that there's a fear component deep down inside um, is probably pretty accurate, that these are responses to threat that are triggered by early experience. So if you've been exposed to it, you're, you potentially have a neurobiological system that makes you more hyper aroused, more vigilant, and more unable to make a good decision about whether to continue down that path or not. Um, so I think from the maltreatment literature, I can say that I think that there are changes that make um, it harder for individuals to adequately make good choices in threatening or stressful situations. And again, for adolescents, the predominance of the peer world for them. So if you have them in a situation where they have a lot of peers around them and you make a command statement as an adult, they've got an entire peer group around them that will sort of trigger them to respond more um, at a higher level. I, I gotta close, so that means you gotta come back. Um, uh, it, it closing me out, but to me, love just keeps uh, dominating this, and I'll use it my own because I don't know if we can use that in the literature, but this is Chris Sylvain with Health Issues, and, and I would say that we gotta hug these children, we gotta hug these parents. If you know how to love, then you're gonna have to teach somebody how to be safe and it's not, you can talk about the culture, we can talk about all of that, but you're gonna have to go to people that are love starved and help them and, and let's fight as hard as we can. Thank you. Thank you.